If you're wondering why I am sitting in my car once again and not at home, it is because we've had a fairly ferocious snowstorm and we're not able to access the internet. And so today we are in fact parked outside one of our favorite coffee shops using the internet reception that we can find here. This does mean, however, that we are joined a much long anticipated return of Jenneline, who Hello. on Hello, YouTube, <laughs> YouTube you can see. Um, if you are a long time, uh, if you are a long time member of our learning community, you will know that for the first year and a half, Jenneline sat in on each and every one of these lectures, keeping me company, which is much appreciated, <laughs> not just by myself, but by many of our students. And in more recent times, Jenneline has taken a uh, a proverbial backseat, <laughs> as it were, uh, and taken on the uh, the management of the Patreon. She edits the lecture transcripts and really does a lot of stuff behind the scenes to make this a a really like seamless experience for you guys, including getting us out onto the road and filming here. <laughs> and with here. coffee. Uh, you know, it says a lot about a snowstorm that it takes out the internet, but not your coffee shop. Kudos so, goes to our local coffee shop. So I'm very lucky to have... Such an incredible producer, editor, mm. person by my side, who I happen to be married to. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> if you're joining us for the very first time, this is a weekly lecture series, which I host every Monday morning, 8 to 9 p.m. Today, a little bit later. A.M. Oh, p.m. Sorry, a.m. Time. <laughs> Thank you. This, Sorry. Gotta keep, gotta, <laughs> this is what the editor does. You okay, I'm honest. not going to interrupt you No, you're totally you allowed. No, no, it's fun. I like this. This is a dynamic that I've missed. I've missed a lot. Um, and so basically, this is an introductory lecture series that I host in which I try to introduce you to some key ideas within Western and continental philosophy and specifically ones related to the works of Slavoj Žižek because I believe that Slavoj Žižek's philosophy is a really good entry point into a lot of other thinkers, including Hegel, Kant, Fichte, Marx, and so on. Um, we're currently in a lecture series which I've titled Spurious Infinities, and this is going to be, this is like, I don't know, like a 10-week series or something like that, and at the end of it, I'm going to be releasing an ebook on Patreon, if you are joining us for the first time, you don't need to have any previous knowledge whatsoever. You can just jump right in. Each lecture is taught with the assumption that it can be enjoyed standalone and that it is both for beginners and for more advanced learners alike. There's differing layers of complexity here. As always, I'd like to say a huge thank you to our patrons who keep this project alive, who allow me to not only teach independently, but to have all these classes available open access for everybody to enjoy. And the fact that people around the world get to participate in these classes gives me so much joy. It makes me so incredibly happy. So a huge thank you to our patrons. And as per usual, our Monday morning ritual, if you'd like to make me truly happy, I would really appreciate it if you dropped a comment letting me know where you're joining us from. Of all the many things that I like about doing this, that is truly my favorite. Just knowing that we find some connection across the world might be naive, might be idealistic, but that's that's truly what, what makes this worthwhile for me. So if you could let me know where you're joining us from, that always makes me incredibly happy. I see someone joining from India. Shout out to India. We have so many students from India, actually, which is great. Mm -hmm. Portugal. Uh, uh, NH would be New Hampshire, New Hampshire. maybe New Hampshire. Um, Kuwait, hello Kuwait. Uh, someone wants to see Jenneline. Jenneline is over here. Hello, Jenneline is with us. Hello from Russia. I'm, Greetings to Russia, Romania. I'm tuning in from the other side of the car. That's not very specific. That's right. Turkey, Maraba. Venezuela, Maraba, Turkey, Arizona. Hello, Nepal. That's incredible. Egypt, Florida, Canada. Hello, Canada. We're close to Canada. Uh, Turkey, Maraba, Poland, Mexico City, Slovenia, Switzerland. That's beautiful. Um, France, bonjour. <laughs> Argentina. We've been enjoying your soccer recently, or football, I should say, before people get upset. Uh, Kurdistan, Hui Morgan, Nederland, uh, India. That's incredible. Thank you guys so, so much. It truly means a lot to me. I see Utrecht again, where I used to live. In fact, where I actually went to university. Lithuania, Morocco. I could sit here for an entire <laughs> hour just reading out these. So thank you guys. You guys rock. I super appreciate it. Um, uh, today I want to talk about... So the lecture today is going to be dedicated to the idea of what Zizek calls symptomatic universality. And if you followed this lecture series so far, you'll know that the main theme is the idea of the spurious infinity. 
And Spurrier's affinity is code for what Hegel calls a false universal, and it's an accusation that he makes against Fichte, that Fichte has Spurrier's infinities. As I, as I already said in a previous lecture, Zizek also accuses certain postmodern thinkers and post-Marxist thinkers of falling into the trap of what he calls spurious infinities within identitarian politics. So it's a really like interesting nut to crack. And if that sounds abstract, I'm going to try to like explain it in a way that is hopefully intuitive and enjoyable to you. In fact, I thought that we should begin by addressing the elephant in the room and we should talk about that infamous Kanye interview that took place the other day on InfraWars. You, you know what I'm alluding to, yes? <clears throat> so the infamous Kanye interview in which uh, Ye, formerly known as Kanye West, made the remark that he loves all people, especially Hitler. And of course, this isn't a hugely offensive, outrageous claim, and we should immediately say that we, we stand against all forms of anti-Semitism, no ifs, no buts. And yet, What's interesting here is that in Kanye's statement that he loves Hitler and his other anti-Semitic outbursts, we see a kind of spurious infinity, a logical conclusion that is reached from within liberalism itself, from within the false universal of liberalism itself. Now, what is one of the false universals of liberalism? It's the idea of universalized love, the idea that we love everybody that you should love everybody. This is also how you should interpret Zizek's critique of love, where he says that love, rather than being a universalizing agent, love is a very particularizing agent, that love differentiates, that if you were in love with somebody and they said, what do you love about me? And you say, well, I love everybody. <laughs> that wouldn't be love. In fact, that would be precisely hate. That would not be love. Love is a particularizing, differentiating affection. I love you above other people. This is like something that I really like from Hannah Arendt, where she says that one of the signs that you're in love is that you don't want to be with others. That whereas friendship blossoms in the company of others, love withers. That love fundamentally is something that isolates you. It's like, a video I made a while back about the Rilkean maxim that to be in love is to guard each other's solitude. You become a world unto yourself. Now, those of you who followed my lecture on love have already heard of all about this. And yet the idea of a universalizing love, a love of all, a love of everything, is thereby a false universal. It masks almost the exact opposite, which could be a kind of hate. And it's also why Zizek says that like, he never loves the world that the ethical attitude of loving the world is disingenuous, that he fundamentally starts by saying, I hate the world. I find the world a miserable place of abject misery and suffering. And it's precisely against the background, against the horizon of that kind of pain that you find something worth living for, something worth fighting for. That love is a kind of resistance against the abyss. It's how you crawl out of it. It's like a rope ladder. It's not something that is a universalizing substance as such. Of course, what we see with Kanye, if you follow his argument, if you can call it that, is that he loves everyone, even and especially Hitler. Now, why would Hitler, according to Kanye, be worthy of, of special love? Well, according to Kanye, Hitler should be worthy of special love because he is hated by so many others. Thereby, Hitler suddenly finds himself as the true minority, the, 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 the person who is the voice of the voiceless. And we find here an incredibly sick and twisted inversion, what Hegel called die verkehrte Welt, or the world upside down, where Hitler is suddenly presented as the lost soul who is deserving of our love. And it's interesting here because obviously what, where Kanye is coming from is from what he believes to be a Christian ethic, a Christian ethic of universal love. And yet the Christian ethic is unconditional love, not universal love. Now, what is the difference between unconditional love? Unconditional love rather than universal love isn't I love everybody but it's I love you above everybody else. I love you no matter what against everybody else. It's a singular instance of particularized love that therein becomes universal. I'll give you an example here. The famous passage where Christ says, or Jesus at this point says, in order to love me, you have to hate your family. 
It's an incredibly difficult passage to understand and to grasp because usually we would think loving your family would be something virtuous and, and, and something a good Christian would do. So why would Jesus posit that you should hate your family in order to love him? Well, think about the Fast and the Furious series. Think about how in Fast and the Furious, the idea of family becomes elevated to a kind of spurious infinity. In each and every movie, we have additional cast members who are included in the family. In fact, even the villains are eventually wrapped back into the family. Family thereby is like the identitarian plus at the end of the LGBTQ sequence. That if you expand the sequence long enough, everyone can be included. Here we find exactly the accusation that Hegel made apropos Fichte. Remember what I said in the previous lecture, that Hegel accused Fichte of being someone who embraced spurious infinities. Because he said the ideal lies beyond the horizon, like a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And that as long as we simply keep searching it, we thereby find an infinite progress, an infinite arc towards justice, towards the absolute good. And Hegel said that as soon as you elevate the idea of the infinite into this, this never reachable space, you don't have a true universal. You simply have a delayed universal, a universal that will never arrive. Here we also have a difference, for example, between Judaism and the Abrahamic faith, or not Abrahamic faith, the Christian faith, sorry. Within Judaism, the event of Christianity hasn't taken place. In a sense, it's disavowed. Judaism is in a perpetual state of waiting, of anticipation, of setting the table, as it were, for the arrival of the Messiah. It's within Christianity that we have the much more traumatic encounter that the event has already happened, that it has already taken place. The revolution within the logic of the Old Testament that now is the New Testament, namely the idea of the community of the faithful, the Trinity of Spirit, and so on, has already taken place. It's like you're not setting the table. It's you've had the dinner party and now you're cleaning up afterwards. This puts Christianity in a fundamentally different position. Ironically, it's the doom mongers, the apocalyptic evangelicals who thereby revert to the less traumatic stance of the Judaic faith. Namely, oh, Christ wasn't the real event. Christ was simply the warm-up act for the true event, which will be the resurrection. The not The real resurrection. coming is, is the apocalypse. The real reckoning, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And thereby we find ourselves within this evangelical moments in a kind of spurious infinitive, right? You can live in a sort of perpetual preparation for the apocalypse, thereby lending a kind of infinite immediacy to your present moment. And therein lies a certain false universal again, or a spurious infinity. Now, to go back to Kanye, when Kanye thereby argues that Hitler is deserving of love because he is so universally hated, we find the logical trap that lies within liberalism, namely the idea that everyone is equally deserving of love, thereby we should love in particular those who are considered by the majority as being not worthy of love. And so in a totally messed up contrarian fashion, it's Kanye who represents himself as the figure of universalized love, that he has the courage to love the one nobody else will love, namely one of the biggest harbingers of hate within the history of the Western world. It's a very sad thing to watch unfold, of course, how these contradictions that are imminent and implicit to liberalism themselves come into fruition. Here we should look a little bit closer at what Zizek calls a symptomatic universal. And in order to do so, we could look at how Zizek critiques liberalism to stick with this topic. So Zizek essentially argues that the two dominant poles of liberalism today tend to be what you might call the liberalism of Democrats in the United States and the liberalism of Republicans. The liberalism of Republicans usually tends to be economic liberalism, the emphasis on free markets, the emphasis on individual liberty, resistance against tyranny, government control, and so on and so forth. Democratic liberalism, which also embraces the tenets of the free market, however, argues that you require a government that ensures the rights and the civic liberties of individuals, of minorities. In other words, we tend to have an egalitarian emphasis within the idea of democratic liberalism, if you will, which for some is progressive liberalism, and, and which can also be identitarian liberalism versus the Republican, more conservative and sometimes reactionary emphasis on the idea of a anti-government liberalism, of something that easily becomes a kind of libertarianism. 
Now, Jizik argues that rather than trying to discern which side of this divide is the true liberalism, whether it is the liberalism of ensuring the equality of individuals through government action, or whether it is the liberalism of protecting the sovereignty of the individual against government, that rather than trying to decide who on which side of this divide has the truer liberalism, we should argue, or we should conclude, that the central identity of liberalism is precisely that it cannot be reconciled except by abstracting into these dual poles. That these two sides of irreconcilable liberalism is the truth of liberalism. That there is no true liberalism behind the mask of these two antagonistic versions. Hence also why we should go back to one of the liberal platitudes today, namely the complaint about tribalism, and we realize that this complaint about tribalism falls prey to the exact same spree as infinite. Namely, the problem with society is that we don't get along. If only we could find a universal frame through which we could experience society, thereby not succumbing to tribes. And yet the logical paradox implicit in this argument is that it's the very same liberals who argue against tribalism who insist on the infinite, the spurious infinite of particularizing identity, whether it's sexual identity, ethnic identity, religious identity, and so on and so forth. And so thereby we have this melting pot of identities in which everyone is supposed to be able to exercise their own individual lifestyle through the lens, which is thereby the disavowed symptomatic lens, namely of the liberalism that is underpinned by global capitalism. And here we can see again, to go back to Kanye, where Kanye veers in the wrong direction. What starts as a critique of capitalism ends up in an anti-Semitic tirade against the idea of a Jewish Zionist plot meant to undermine the virility of men and, and the engagement in society through true family values and so on and so forth. This is the pseudo-revolution that is always offered by fascism. The idea that there is an enemy other that thereby is trying to undermine the true universal of the nation, of the fatherland, of the faith, of the family, and that as long as we fight this, rea this enemy through reactionary, namely anti-liberal means, we will return to the true universal. Here you see again the problem with this idea of a false universal masquerading as a true one, the idea of the family, the idea of the faith, the idea of the fatherland that has to be protected against an enemy that is thereby elevated to a universal substance, namely the idea of the Jew, capital J, when the reality is, of course, that the Jew doesn't exist. That, and this is something that Zizek argues always over and over again, is that the anti-Semitic fantasy and accusation about the Jew has nothing to do with lived real Jewish experience. It is entirely a universalizing of an abstract reactionary fear predicated upon upholding the empty core, the ontological emptiness within the idea of the nation, which is itself a false universal. And so in order to mask or uphold this false universal, it requires the antithesis of another false universal, of the idea of the Jew, the enemy, the enemy of the people, and so on and so forth. And so here we have the problem with what, what Hegel calls a spurious infinity, is that in order to sustain the illusion that it is not in fact a false universal, but a true one, it requires a kind of reactionary positing of either something that cannot be reached, that lies perpetually over the horizon, some arc of justice that will never end, or the positing of an antithetical reactionary enemy that will thereby eliminate your true universal unless you eliminate it first. And that is a trap that we find within the link from liberalism towards Kanye's outburst about loving Hitler. I'm going very fast here, but there's like things that I want to unpack. Is this too fast? Okay. So I want to emphasize a little bit more this idea of symptomatic universality, which is something that Zizek writes about um, throughout his works. And if you will, symptomatic universality is one of Zizek's main contributions to Hegelian theory, but also to Marxism. Now, there's a couple of different ways that we can approach this problem of the symptomatic universal. One of the most easy to understand ways is that we find the idea, and this relates again to Kanye, we find this idea of the symptomatic universal within the All Lives Matter movement. That, again, within All Lives Matter, we have the positing of a false universal. Namely, that all lives matter, which is itself usually a reaction to the insistence that black lives matter less than white lives. You could paraphrase here the Orwell quote from Animal Farm, that all lives are equal, but some are more equal than others. And Zizek's argument is that what makes this a symptomatic universal is not only is it a reaction to the, in, the particularizing insistence, in other words, the resistance of black people within the United States, that their own individual rights are not counted within this universalizing frame, but it's precisely that the people who get to say that all lives matter 
are those who are already part of the privileged majority, are already those who hold power within a society. In the exact same manner that before the idea of all lives matter, we had this fairly commonplace notion that white people would say that they were colorblind. To be colorblind is thereby the particular privilege of the white majority that thereby argues that its position, its naive colorblindness, is thereby the universal norm. And that it, and this is exactly how we end up in this weird position where black people or African Americans are accused of being racists by white liberals, saying, why are you so obsessed with race? Can't you see that we were all colorblind before you started making such a fuss? That's the particularly screwed up inversion that takes place within this false universal of colorblindness, which we find simply in its newer, newer iteration within the idea of all lives matter. And so in a, in a typically sort of Lacanian slash Hegelian slash Marxist fashion, all lives matter becomes thereby a banner under which certain lives are not even counted as lives to begin with. Here we can go also to Judith Butler's argument from 20 years ago about precarious life and that the battle to make a life matter is always a political one. This doesn't even have to be within our own society. Think about the manner in which a life that is not white in a foreign country, a developing nation, or the Middle East, is often considered tacitly to be of lesser value than an American life. Think about how even the kind of passport that you hold will designate the value that you have within the international system, whether you are worth protecting, whether you are worth making a political fuss about or not. That the manner in which we value individual life is thereby a political struggle always. That there is no universal frame through which all life is sacred. In fact, that all life being sacred is often the way in which we lose focus of particularizing individual lives. This is what happens as soon as we focus on the universal in general. That the more we focus on the idea of the abstract universal, namely all of man or humanity, the easier it is to end up in inhuman actions. Think about Hegel's definition of good and evil. His theory is that rather than being binaries, rather than being good versus evil and evil versus good, that the, defini of evil, the definition of evil is simply the good which believes itself to be absolutely, i.e. universally good. The good which believes itself to be fighting against absolute evil is thereby evil. It's not that evil is a regression or a digression from the absolute substance of good. It's that good recognizing in itself no evil is thereby evil. In other words, you could argue, to take Zizek's language here, that the idea of symptomatic universality lies implicitly within the idea of evil itself. Evil, rather than being the antithesis of good, is precisely the good which believes itself to be the antithesis of evil. Now you can see the dialectical unfolding, which is a properly Hegelian one. Hegel argues that rather than having an abstract universal that finds concrete manifestations of its, of its particularity, it's the exact other way around. It's within the abstract that we find the universal. To put that in less abstract terms, remember the difference between the Kantian sublime and the Burkean sublime. The Burkean sublime held that we had an absolute ideal in the sky and that particular emanations of this ideal could be found here on earth. For example, a beautiful or attractive person would thereby be sublime because they radiated some essence that was an essence of the absolute. I like to refer to this as the trickle-down economy of the absolute. Namely, that God sprinkles <laughs> us with his love and dust and that some of us get more sprinkles than others and are thereby elevated onto this plateau. Of course, the postmodernists will immediately and the post-structuralists will, post will immediately interject that the very way in which we conceptualize the idea of beauty is already, always already overdetermined by structural inequalities within our own society. Think about the way in which we sell lightning skin creams for African American women in this country. However, apropos the Burkean sublime, we have the Kantian sublime. The Kantian sublime holds that rather than having an absolute that trickles down into particular instances of beauty here, like through art or someone who's very attractive, that we think of them as being like a, a, a living refraction of the absolute. For Kant, it's the other way around. We have no access to the absolute. The absolute remains intranscendentable, uh, intranscend, uh, unreachable for us. And that thereby, when we find ourselves in an encounter with something that represents the non-knowable or unknowable nature of God or the absolute, we thereby find ourselves within the realm of the sublime.
In other words, the sublime, rather than being evidence or a particular example of the absolute imminence of God or the absolute itself, is instead the marker of its own impossibility through reflection in the world as such. To put this in Kantian terms, if we take the difference between the noumenon, the noumenon being the absolute, the thing on sich, and the phenomenon, the thing that appears, for Kant, the problem is that the, that the noumenon cannot appear within phenomenon that the phenomenological element of the ideal, of the sublime, is thereby not the success of the trickling down of the absolute, but precisely a marker of where it has failed. To give you a couple of examples, the one that I always use is when, when you say, I love you so much I couldn't possibly put it into words. Here we have the dynamic or the logic of the Kantian sublime. I love you so much I cannot put it into words. I have thereby put my failure to express how much I love you into words, thereby I've succeeded. I've said I love you because I said I couldn't tell you how much I loved you. Here we can relate this to the Lacanian idea of hysteria. The Lacanian idea of hysteria is that you are radically questioning the other, that the relationship between you, your particular identity, and the other has to be somehow filled in or, or foreclosed. It's also why Lacan says that the most dangerous question you could ask is to say, do you really love me? Because if somebody answers, yes, I love you, then you could accuse them of saying, well, you're just saying that to appease me, thereby you don't love me. And so the truthful content of the expression of love is thereby precisely the futility or the impossibility of the expression thereof in the first place, hence the Kantian sublime. And is this so far so good? Okay. So what I'm trying to point out here is that the relationship between the Burkean sublime and the Kantian sublime follows two different logical trajectories. In the Burkean sublime, we have the absolute, which trickles down into particular emanations. If you will, we have here a kind of spurious infinity again. Namely, the absolute is a kind of zero-sum substance that is infinite and that finds infinite manifestations here on Earth. How many pretty people can you find on the internet? Well, that's how much love of God there is on Earth. I mean, the sequence could be extended out infinitum. Anytime you create something that is thereby worthy of God, you would have created something sublime. It's also why the driving force of of, uh, of religious art was precisely this emphasis on trying to put something into the world that was a minor representation or what Plato might have called a copy of a copy of the a copy of a coffee copy of a copy of the ideal essence. One of the ruptures, not to do a digression on art here, but one of the ruptures that we see within this logic comes within the Dutch invention of the still life. And it's very important to note that the Dutch movement from theology into a kind of Protestant mercantilism, into the idea of the early stages of a global global economy um, that happens within Holland is linked to the transition from divine art through Protest the Protestant build and storm, namely the destruction of the effigies of worship, towards the invention of the still life. Now, of course, the still life precedes this, but the still life, basically, as you know, is the idea that you paint something as it is, like a flower or an animal or, 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 or even a landscape becomes a form of still life which famously, of course, the Impressionists then are against, but that's for another time. The point here is that the emergence of the still life is a vanishing mediator between the idea that the driving force of art is the representation of the ideal in a trickle-down scenario, namely that something that you create is worthy of God because it is a representation or figuration of God's grace here on earth, towards the idea of art as a commodity. And the beauty is that this idea of the still life, this uncanny emanation by which you have reproduced something through its own abstraction into art, thereby you sell this abstraction through a further abstraction of art as a commodity, is a kind of Hegelian negation of negation, through which we see the unfolding of the internal limit of the idea of the ideal within godly, uh, absolute religious art itself. That rather than seeing the still life as being the opposite of religious art, it is the necessary unfolding of a contradiction that lies from within. In other words, if you take Chizdik's language, you could argue that the emergence of still life is thereby a symptomatic universality that flows imminently from the idea of the false universal posited within the productive mechanism of religious icons and art. Too much? Too fast? Okay, good. And, and so what's really, what's really fascinating here, to go back to what I was trying to argue earlier, is that Hegel posits, for example, with good and evil, that rather than seeing them as two sides of the same coin, that we have, uh, sorry, rather than seeing them as opposites, as antitheses, good versus evil, that evil is itself good, which believes itself to be fighting against evil. In other words, that evil is an abstract or symptomatic emanation from within the false universal of the idea of good itself. It's a really powerful idea because it fundamentally disrupts the whole Kantian formalistic edifice within which we would have the idea of the absolute in the sky and the antinomies that bar us from the absolute through human reason. Instead for Hegel, and this is basically Hegel's ontology, which I've said many times before, instead of seeing reason or human objects or the world of phenomenons as being 
a, a regression or a digression, an antithesis to the absolute, we find the absolute emerging precisely within the disavowed content of subjectivity as such, of the world of appearances as such. In other words, for Zizek, not only do we have symptomatic universality within the idea of false universality, but true universality, the opposite of a spurious infinite, is thereby innately or, or necessarily itself symptomatic symptomatic of the unfolding of the disavowal of the false universal within which what within which what was posited as the as the true universal and now we can start understanding why Zizek makes an argument about marxism within marxism we have the same argument remember revolution is not simply the antithesis to capitalism this is also why the idea of revolution is so easily co-opted within capitalist commercial entities the idea that to buy an iPad is to be part of a revolution against the corporate culture of Microsoft, for example, that more consumption and the manner in which your consumption forms your lifestyle thereby becomes an act of resistance is precisely one of the self-regurgitating mechanisms of capitalism. And so in the same exact manner, revolution or resistance isn't simply positing that you have an alternative to capitalism, that you are positing another system. Hereby, you would very, if you followed that logic, you would end up in the Churchillian logic, by which capitalism is the worst of all systems and yet the, the, only, the best. What is the quote exactly? <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. And instead of being revolution against capitalism, the Marxist argument is simply that revolution emerges imminently from within the false universal of capitalism as such. The embodiment of this false universal through its own symptomatic universality, which has as of yet to be recognized for Marx, is of course the idea of the working class. And, and I'll get back to that in a moment, but I want to build up a couple of steps here. So one of the things that Marx argues that I think is relatively underappreciated is he's never arguing that the working class wants to have more rights within capitalism. That one of the unique features of the working class is that it is the one class that wants to eliminate itself. In other words, that once you eliminate capitalism, you thereby have eliminated the working class. The working class being not an innate natural category, but a symptomatic category within the functioning of capitalism itself. Hence also you realize that the false universal within capitalism, which has to be sustained by what Marx calls bourgeois ideology through the commodity fetish, is the very process by which your freedom, which is sold to you, is the freedom to sell your own labor. Namely, the universal precondition of capitalism isn't to say you can all act freely within the universal substance of capitalism, but to say that the universal substance of capitalism, which is commodification, now becomes retroactively applied to you, which has to be disavowed through the through the becoming the active agent of your own exploitation by means of assuming your own freedom by means of freely selling your labor. Here I have again this dialectical inversion where where within. The false universal of capitalism has to be sustained or elevated through ideology. Namely, ideology, in, in Zizekian fashion, but also in Althusserian fashion, ideology is simply that which sustains the false universal from within, that which gives us the logic or the incentive structure by which we fail to see the false universality that thereby has to be upheld. Again, we can start seeing how like anti-Semitic positing, anti-Semitic arguments are one of the ways in which we have the ideological supplement towards the contradictions within liberalism themselves, saying that we need to not be tribal, we need to come together in the face, we need to come together in the face of a common enemy, namely the idea of the anti-Semitic other or the immigrant or any kind of universalized other thereby becomes ideological, an ideological supplement to the upholding of a false universal that is thereby ontologically void from within, namely the idea of the nation, the people, and so on and so forth. It's also why many conservatives and reactionaries are so fundamentally threatened by the idea of quote-unquote cultural Marxism or postmodern postmodernism, because the specter that is usually created is of a nihilistic force that wants to take away the things that truly matter, that have substance, and turn them into a kind of spurious infinite by which anything could be, anybody could be anything, and nothing ever matters. And, and relativism is usually the, co the commonplace contemporary version of nihilism. That postmodernists are relativists, that nothing really matters, and that thereby you spiral into a nihilism in which you could justify everything. The exact opposite is true. Once you defend the idea of the false universal of the nation, the family, the true sexual identity of man and woman, the idea of the virility of man and the submissive, the, the submissive helpful nature of woman, and so on and so forth, once you have to defend those values that are thereby that are already ontologically void, you are willing to go all the way. There is nothing that you would not do. Here you end up again in this universalized love, which is that I love the idea of the universal, the idea of man, the idea of mankind, the idea of woman, and that thereby there is nothing that I would be unwilling to do against women in order to uphold the idea of the ideal woman. Hence, we find ourselves also in this contemporary juxtaposition of people who argue that they are defending women who also vote, for example, to 
restrict women's access to abortion. He, that is not a paradox. That is a symptomatic unfolding from the upholding of something which is empty from within. I've already used this before. You can see the same thing with so-called toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity tends to uphold the idea of the ideal woman so that the male identity can latch itself onto this idea of femininity that has to be protected by a strong, dominant male. We don't need to do Lacan's theory of sexuation again, but we've done it before. To go back to Marxism, the argument in Marxism is thereby that what happens is that instead of having a revolution in which you gain more individual particular rights within the system, that you find more ways of identitarian expression, which is called spurious infinities of postmodernism, instead it's about saying that the working class is itself the symptomatic emanation, the Hegelian abstract that reveals the truth of capitalism. In other words, that rather than being the antithesis that is against capitalism, it is the suppressed truth of capitalism. Namely, that the exploitation of the working class, the universalization of the principle of the commodity into the commodity fetish, and the experience of the identity of oneself as being synonymous with the commodity, is thereby the truth of capitalism. It is not an opposing view to capitalism. It is not the loyal opposition to capitalism. It is the truth of capitalism recognized itself for what it is. And for Marx, that once this truth is recognized, we thereby have a, a, an inversion that takes place, an inversion by which the central incentive structures of capitalism, which thereby reveal themselves as having been ideologically buttressed by the idea of your own freedom to sell your own labor equally, in other words, to identify as a commodity, thereby fade away. That the act of resistance within capitalism starts by seeing capitalism for what it is. Now, here we have to add something, which is that in Marx's writing on the commodity fetish, he argues that it's not simply enough to know the commodity fetish and to know how it works. After all, you could say, I've just learned this in this class, and yet nothing would fundamentally change. It's not like suddenly you wake up and the world has changed because we've realized how the commodity fetish works. This is the transition that Zizek argues is so important from the idea of, the, of Marxist bad faith towards the existentialist mauvaise foi, bad faith. Now, what is the difference from a Marxist and an existentialist perspective? The Marxist perspective was for they know not what they do. In other words, people participate, but they don't understand how the system works, and so in a sense they are naive. Zizek argues that the manner in which people are co-opted is precisely because they are not naive. Because everyone fundamentally knows how the system works. Everybody knows that the idea of a meritocracy or equality is an ideologically uh, uh, unfair proposition. That all lives don't matter. Even the people who propose this know this to be fundamentally true. And yet, what happens is that because we all see through it, we find ourselves, in a sense, necessitated or, or, or bound to further contribute to it. To say, this is also where like self-help writers have a really interesting take, which is often they start with what appears to be a critique of capitalism, namely, you know, the rich have an unequal system by which you will never be rich. And then they pause it to, then they, they pivot to something completely else, unless you adopt the secret of the capitalists. And then we find ourselves in the rich dad, poor dad scenario. Here's what the rich dad would say versus what the poor dad would say. And, and this is one of the painful realities of capitalism is that the seeing through the inequality that is innate to the system is what further drives or propels forward participation within said inequality. Hence also the quote unquote secret that the Marxists would propose, which is similar to the Lacanian secret or the Hegelian secret of Christianity, is that there is precisely no secret. That once you realize that the secret of capitalism is that the idea of there being a secret of capitalism, a secret that the rich are keeping from you, is itself the secret, that's when you realize that it falls apart. In the same way that Hegel argues, apropos Christianity, that the logical transition from a transcendental model of the absolute, namely the more pagan mythology that we find within the Old Testament, the idea that we have to be reunited with the Godhead or the figure, becomes inverted in the New Testament through the desublimating agent of Christ on the cross, through which for a momentary instance God stops believing in himself, that the secret of Christianity is thereby precisely, as Lacan already argues, building upon Hegel, that there is no secret, that there is no secret in the sky, that God doesn't have a secret message or a code that he wants to give you and that we have to unravel. Instead, it's the opposite. It's that God is inscrutable, unknowable, that God exists purely within the repetitive semblance of faith itself. And that within this proposition, we thereby have to create our own attachments, our own strings, that we have to enact faith amongst and within ourselves. That there's something very revolutionary that happens within the insight that there is no secret behind Christ. That the secret, or what, what Catholics call the mystery, is thereby precisely the mystery of the faith, of the transubstantiation, of the idea of the community of the faithful coming together as if, 
And this also, if you go to Paul, the writings of St. Paul, we have here as if. And one of the things that Zizek almost tacitly does is linking the Paul, one has to act as if, to the idea that we have within Bartleby from Melville the Scribner of I would prefer not to. That one thereby has to participate in the world of the Gentiles as if. And that within this as if, you already find a kernel of resistance towards the possibility of a new universal that is itself posited as if. A universal that doesn't make sense within the incentive structures of our own contemporary predicament, but has to emerge precisely from within the collectivity of the faithful that thereby posits the as if antithesis to the idea of the genteel society. I'm going too fast here. We'll, we'll, we'll get back to this in some of the shorter videos that I, that I post on YouTube. I'm trying to like rush through a lot of material. <laughs> it's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Too much? It's, no. Okay. Um, so I want to conclude here on a couple of notes, which is that the, the, the proposition of this lecture was to talk about Zizek's idea of symptomatic universality. Now, one of the things that I've been hinting at, but not fully articulated, is that the very idea of the Hegelian true universal, which he posits as the opposite of the false universal, is a code or a key towards cracking the Hegelian ontology. What I mean by that is that for Hegel, the true universal isn't something that is complete or something that cannot be accessed. Instead, for Hegel, the true universal lies only within what he calls the abstract universal. In other words, you could make the argument that what Zizek calls symptomatic universality is the precondition upon which true universality appears. Now, here we have to juxtapose the two versions of symptomatic universality that I proposed earlier. First, the idea of all lives matter, or I am colorblind. Here we have a a symptomatic universality that presents itself as universal and yet is the emanation or the articulation of a privileged position that simply uh, applies that there is no difference because you are already in the position of power. Again, as Orwell writes, everyone is equal, but some are more equal than others. All lives matter, but some lives matter more than others, if you will. In opposition to this, we have the Marxist idea of what I call the symptomatic universality, which is that the working class emerges from within the internal contradictions of capitalism itself. It is not antithetical to it. It's something that emanates from it as its own exception, an exception which proves the rule. Now, this is where I have to introduce one more key component, which we will talk about more next week, which is that Zizek argues, building upon the work of Ernesto Laclau, that thereby we have to make a transition from the symptomatic universal to what he calls the hegemonic universal. The symptomatic universal remains on the level of pseudo-revolution, on promising you that everything will change, but yet fundamentally nothing changes. Thereby, the manner in which change itself becomes regurgitated within the substance that allows no change. The manner in which fascists will promise you that you are free, thereby giving you that which you crave, which is the lack of freedom and the lack of having to think for yourself. In the same manner in which conspiratorial-minded thinkers on the internet believe themselves to be the ultimate free thinkers and yet fall prey to the very traps of the algorithm that has sucked them into these conspiratorial alt-right pipeline. This quote-unquote freedom, this reason masking as its opposite, or if you will, unreason masking as its opposite, is symptomatic universality. It upholds the idea that you are the one true individual, beautifully blessed soul who's so much more intelligent than everybody else. And then you realize that everybody feels this way, that everybody who's being nasty and mean on the internet thinks that they're the privileged few who have seen through everything else. Thereby, the universal condition of society becomes that you think that you are an island unto yourself, that you are preaching the truth and that everybody else is wrong. The mistake, the symptomatic mistake, would thereby deposit the liberal antidote to this, which is to say we need less tribalism. We need to have more consensus. We need to have more agreement. We need to have stronger democratic institutions by which we can find the, the norm, the common mean of what everybody believes to be true. Instead, we have to recognize this for what it is. A play for a hegemonic universal, that anytime we have any kind of universal that is temporarily posited as being truthful or the norm, as something that is simply so true that it is uncontested, we have a position of hegemony. A position, as Althusser puts it, uh, as Laclau puts it, in which what appears to be true is momentarily the result of a particular historical constellation by which something is posited as true. Here we have to go back to the emphasis on truth that has become so important for liberals, for example, within the context of the pandemic, that we've come to realize that the truth isn't capital T truth that speaks for itself. Instead, the truth has to be formulated. The truth doesn't speak for itself. It has to be spoken through us. That we have to continuously articulate the truth against untruths. And of course, the problem thereby is that we end up on the Kantian sublime. We end up in Hegel's definition of good and evil. Rather than having truth versus falsehood, we realize that the idea of an absolute truth is itself what falsehood is. That falsehood not being a regression from the idea of the absolute mean of truth, that falsehood is precisely the idea of thinking that the truth is immutable as such. In other words, 
what truth is, is simply falsification and continued falsification, and that the embrace of falsification is thereby the idea of truth, and that the idea of falsehood is the slavish dogmatic following of the idea of a truth that is universalized. And so what Zizek is arguing, and this is something I'm going to develop more in the lecture next week, is that we have to start with what we see as the critique of symptomatic universality, but it has to lead us towards the positing of hegemonic universality, of the power structures that are implicit within positing what is universal. The symptomatic universality is simply how it, leaked, how it leaks through the cracks of the hegemonic universal. And then in order to posit a true universal, one has to thereby create or a play towards the idea of engaging in the resistance against hegemony, the idea of positing a hegemonic universal. Of course, the Hegelian argument would be that there is never a strictly speaking foundational hegemonic universal as such, that the progression of history is simply, or what Hegel calls spirit, is simply the unfolding of the imminent contradictions within any, con any particular moment of hegemonic universal into its own symptomatic disavowal. In other words, that what history simply is, what truth or spirit simply is for Hegel, is that we always have a temporary hegemonic universal which presents itself as being absolute, which then succumbs to symptomatic disavowals or symptomatic uh, ideology. I mean, ideology is not a Hegelian preposition, but, but, but symptomatic universals, and that from within the contradiction between the symptomatic universal, which is upheld as a hegemonic universal, we have the birth of the new. In other words, we're back at the Gramscian notion that it is that the old is dying and the new has not yet been born. Hegel simply elevates this idea to, a, to the infinite, that rather than having the spurious infinite of a universal that lies beyond the horizon, it is instead an infinite, a universal that we find within the particularizing substance of the continual dispersion of differentiating features between the idea of a symptomatic universal and a hegemonic universal in the first place. That is the Hegelian ontology, namely the juxtaposition of the concrete and the abstract and inverting it into the abstract and the concrete. Rather than having a universal from which we have the antithesis, we have a universal that consists only of its own antithesis. In other words, what he calls self-relating negativity or the self-reflective force, which he calls a negation of negation. All of that and more we'll be covering in the following lectures. So like if this is a lot to take in, we're going to take it step by step. Trust me, we're going to make this easier as it gets along. <laughs> Yet, there's this great quote that I like. Um, I forget who it's from. I was, writing, I was reading it the other day. That in our, in our society, or in, in the world, we have words for difficult and words for easy. And yet, a word that we are lacking within our lexicon is a word for something that is very difficult, but it is so difficult that once you realize it, it becomes easy. And that is exactly what Hegelian dialectics and Shizik's philosophy is. It's very difficult until it suddenly becomes easy. It's neither difficult nor easy. It is easy or it is difficult in its very easiness. On that note, thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you, Jenlyn, for joining us today. Can I say briefly a small bit of housekeeping? Yeah. Um, if you are interested in listening to this lecture again oh, or yeah. <laughs> reading, the, <laughs> reading the, uh, the transcript as an essay, that's something that we put out for every single one of these lectures because there were a lot of really interesting ideas There's a lot. <laughs> that I look forward to going back and revisiting. <laughs> we make them available for a subscription of $10 a month. So I hope that you will consider checking out our Patreon where we host a uh, Discord, we post audio, we post transcripts, and of course the ebook. So thank you very much for joining us. And, and a huge thank you to our patrons uh, yes. who make this possible. Um, this is a very niche enterprise, but very fun for us. And a huge thank you to Jenlene, who works really tirelessly behind the scenes to make this possible on the internet, who does all the production and <laughs> Patreon and the <laughs> editing, and who also converses with our patrons, which yeah. I really appreciate. We have a nice community, um, so thank you for being part of our living community. It's and a I, lot to us. And I believe that Jenlene has also made some changes to Patreon. So if you yes. would like to see those changes, please go to www.patreon.com forward slash Jenlene and Julian. And we're going to be picking up this discussion in like 10, 15 minutes on Discord. I already see some people talking about Discord. Uh, our patrons can join us on Discord where, uh, and our Substack members can join us on Discord where we're going to be hosting a live Q&A uh, right after this session. Thank you guys, as always, for taking the time to start your week with us in philosophical fashion. We wish you a very wonderful week. Bye-bye. Let me do it. <laughs> there you go.